Well, uh, with the understanding that people will probably uh, find their way in over the next hour or so, we're going to uh, begin with the crowd we've got, sort of a la Donald Rumsfeld. You start a panel with the crowd you've got, not the crowd that you wish you had. So, um, and the goal this hour is to um, expose, uh, discuss, light up some of the aspects of uh, keeping women healthy around the world that uh, either is getting the attention it merits, isn't getting the attention it merits, or what we can do uh, to fix that situation. Maybe you've heard the old Chinese proverb, women hold up half the sky. It was a favorite of Mao Zedong, but that's no reason why we shouldn't quote it now. It acknowledges something people know intuitively about women's essential role in making a society coherent and operable. In many societies, women are holding up more of the sky than they're given credit for as primary producers of food and fiber and also the providers of most of the child care. And yet, women's health, like women's work, has not been given sufficient attention as part of a national development strategy or as simple social justice. Is that changing? What would a policy that takes into account the different health needs of women look like? Is the social standing to control their fertility and childbearing, exert some control over their sex lives, a culturally conditioned luxury meant for women in rich and industrialized countries, or part of a baseline assumption about the rights of women everywhere? I'm joined by two terrific guests for this session, the Honorable Mary Robinson, the first woman to serve as Ireland's president, former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and particularly germane for this afternoon's conversation, the Chair Emerita of the International Institute for Environment and Development and a founding member and Chair Emerita of the Council of Women World Leaders and President of Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative. I'm also joined by Deepak Chopra, author, teacher, physician, co-founder of the Chopra Center, who's been telling Americans for decades now about the connection between the health of the mind and the health of the body. Well, Mary Robinson, let me start with you. What are the gaps, as uh, you have been uh, traveling almost nonstop over the last decade, and you've seen uh, the health condition of women across the globe, where do the gaps emerge? The gaps are huge, and until very recently, were largely almost invisible and neglected. We know that women find themselves more in situations of poverty, have the caring role, uh, all of these issues. But one of the uh, real disgraces, I have to use that word, absolute disgraces has been the fact that maternal mortality has not been addressed before now in a really serious way. It is the uh, MDG5, the MDG that's really not improving in the way that was envisaged um, by 2015. And the reasons for that are uh, many, actually, and quite complex. But one of the major problems was that it didn't become a big issue until comparatively recently. It now is on the agenda of many women leaders. And I think Sarah Brown in the United Kingdom, um, uh, wife of um, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, um, is one of the people that comes to mind. But there are a lot of meetings now of women leaders. We must address this issue. But why is it that... Uh, we still have a shameful statistic that uh, at least 500,000 women die unnecessarily in childbirth from not having access to emergency obstetric care, not having somebody, a birth attendant, not having the adequate uh, nutrition, the safeguards against contracting malaria, etc. And uh, in Ireland, when a mother dies giving birth, the maternity hospital or whatever mourns. It's, 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 it's a terribly sad moment. In many countries in Africa and South Asia, giving birth or becoming pregnant rather is a life-threatening experience for the woman. She's by no means sure 
that she will survive the experience. And that is absolutely unacceptable. It is completely denying the commitment that we should have to say that health and right to health is a human right. It has practical consequences right to the highest attainable standard of health. And what does it mean in practice? If I can briefly outline what I've been trying to learn with my colleagues in realizing rights, it's not one single thing. It's actually like a jigsaw in the poorest countries. In order to address maternal mortality, you have to have a functioning basic health system, even in the rural areas, so that women can have access to emergency obstetric care. A certain percentage of women need a C-section, and if they don't get it, then they will die. Um, that is, you know, simplifying, that's the reality. And therefore, uh, we must have a system where every pregnant woman, um, and indeed before becoming pregnant, women have access to family planning. So that's one of the issues. Another issue is access to that emergency obstetric care. And we were talking in the earlier session about uh, the migration of doctors and nurses from the poorest countries. And I know from our conversation earlier, you were in Tanzania, where they are using uh, mid-level providers with special training, um, several years of training in obstetric care. And we're seeing the evidence now that they can provide very good uh, access to care. But it's in certain regions of Tanzania. It's in certain regions of Malawi and Mozambique. It's not across the board yet. And these mid-level providers aren't um, adequately recognized. Of course, you also need doctors. We're not talking about a second-class system. We're talking about um, an overall uh, system where there's also local community workers, um, community-based health care, which is very often the most important um, uh, beginnings because that's where you have the access to reproductive health family planning. Um, but recently, and I was very pleased about this as um, somebody who puts a great emphasis on health as a human right, Amnesty International, and when I say Amnesty International in an audience like this, you probably think immediately of the core agenda of Amnesty, political prisoners, Guantanamo Bay type issues, no torture, etc. There's more than two million members worldwide campaigning on these issues. Well, the senior leadership of Amnesty under Irene Khan, the pres present um, head of Amnesty, decided that, in fact, this isn't adequate as a, an agenda for the largest membership human rights body in the world, that they had to address the other side of human rights, rights to food and uh, sanitation and health and education and shelter. These are all rights. They're all guaranteed. We have to progressively realize them. There's a lot of literature about them. There are special rapporteurs who focus on them. And so Amnesty have a demand dignity campaign that they've just launched. And the demand dignity campaign is looking from the point of view of rights of the poor. If you're in a very poor village, what are your human rights? I sometimes ask women. In fact, I, I make it a habit when I'm in African countries. In, in March, I was in Liberia with my colleagues. Then some of us went to the Democratic Republic of Congo and to Rwanda. And I constantly asked women, you know, what, what, what does human rights mean to you? Tell me. And more or less the answer would be access to water and freedom from violence. Both of those are very important for tackling maternal mortality figures. Both of them. Um, Amnesty's approach will be to combat um, the degree of violence, um, domestic violence and wider sexual violence, particularly in situations of conflict, to address early child marriage, to address discrimination in property and land rights, to um, have education access to very accessible and very uh, well, um, uh, you know, sort of very appropriate family planning and reproductive health um, uh, care, because this is all important. So the pieces of the jigsaw that I see are how do we bring all this together? Um, there are people who are focusing on the access to emergency obstetric care. There are people who are focusing on discrimination against women. There are people who are focusing on violence. But so, and there are people who are focusing on nutrition, another factor. But somehow we're not bringing this together holistically. And I think until we do, we probably won't address maternal care. There's just one other issue that I'll raise, but I won't develop it because I know you want to have a wider conversation. I'm very pleased that there's about to be a report coming out on the health of the adolescent girl. Because the adolescent girl, very often now, is a young pregnant woman because of early child marriage. And it's, you know, it, it links very well. And it, it, again, has been a very neglected area. Well, it's rare that a former head of state gives you an opening to promote something on the news hour. But I'll just take this little second to mention that the series from Tanzania 
on the training of, uh, of clinicians uh, will run in September, just after Labor Day, so be there. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, women's ability to control their own sex lives and the terms under which it's carried on. I was in Soweto and uh, had just come from um, Saturday morning funerals. And this is one of the most breathtaking sights you can imagine. As far as the eye can see in this graveyard, funerals of people who were dying in their 30s and 40s from HIV. Mm. And I was talking to women in the marketplace about whether or not they can refuse their husband sex, mm. whether they can insist that he wear a condom yeah. because uh, widespread uh, use of sexual mm. partners outside the marital yeah. bond is very common. Mm. They looked at me and they said, oh no, of course I can't say no. Mm. Well, it's, there's one of those moments where the tr a chasm opens mm. up between your comfy life in Washington, right. D.C. and life for a young woman in mm. Soweto who feels that the terms mm. under which she negotiates that part mm. of her life uh, are entirely different yeah. from a woman somewhere else mm. in the world. Yeah. Well, I don't know what you can do about that. Mm. I had a very similar experience, actually very close by in, in Botswana. Um, Botswana is not as poor as some other African countries, but it's had a devastating AIDS pandemic, as we know. And there was a, small, a conference bringing women particularly together on HIV and AIDS a couple of years ago that my colleagues and I were involved in, in supporting. And the night before, we had the women speakers, or not, well, the speakers, and they were mainly women, and there were one or two um, male speakers also at the conference, um, talking about exactly the issues, you're, the, the, the additional complexity of AIDS with all the cultural surrounds. And the women were expressing concern about the policy um, abstinence, be faithful, use condoms, ABC, which was, in fact, influencing a lot of AIDS funding. And they were saying, look, this isn't real in our context. We wish it was, but it's not. So it doesn't help to try to come from the outside with a more ideological, ideally, yes, but in practice, no. And there was a young Ethiopian student helping, um, and she was listening to this discussion about the ABC policy. And she said, you know, why is there so much focus on the first three letters of the alphabet? <coughs> and she more or less had said it to me because I was facilitating the discussion. And I said, okay, I said, I challenged her. I said, what would you do with the next three letters, D, E, F? And she said, don't eliminate the future. That was how she saw, from her perspective, how devastating it was. Her contemporaries were dying. They were dying because they were unnecessarily contracting AIDS from male partners. There was a lot of discussion of the female condom. Why is there not more emphasis on bringing forward the female condom? And there are cultural issues there as well. But the male condom has been pushed and has been, you know, is, 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 is much more available. But that doesn't allow women uh, to, uh, to, to make the decision, if you like. And many, many women do not feel they have any right to refuse their husband, whether the husband or partner has AIDS or not. And, and then when the um, uh, husband contacts AIDS, and when, he, when it, it, it's clear that he has AIDS, he very often blames the wife. Um, and you know, there, are, there are many issues. On the family planning itself, just to mention this, in, uh, you know, finally, in a more structured way, uh, one of the things that we are involved in, in realizing rights with support from both the Gates and the Packard Foundation is working with ministers of health in four African countries and Nepal. And they competed for a program on financing for health equity, on aid effectiveness. And three of the countries, and they're all in West Africa, Sierra Leone, uh, Mali, and uh, Senegal, uh, also have a similar program on reproductive health, as well as the other factors. And they already had a kind of program that they wanted to promote more. And we're helping with the management side. We're helping with um, a know-how, because you know, in a number of countries, the Minister of Health in the Cabinet is not important. Mm. Um, you know, they, they don't have sway like the Minister of Finance. They don't, they can't negotiate, and health is seen as a cost, not as, um, you know, necessary for development. And then women's health, which we're talking about, is way down the scale. So to get the Minister of Health and the head of the, the Secretariat of Health talking about reproductive health and promoting it is a vital part of, you know, addressing it from a structural point of view.
are those countries that have elected women heads of state or government um, had any better track record in this regard? Because some developing countries have done that, along hmm. with countries in Western Europe, uh, Indonesia, uh, Sri Lanka, India, uh, Pakistan. Uh, I don't know if, uh, hmm. if just having a woman head of state or government is necessarily going to get more attention <laughs> to women's health. Well, it's interesting. There is some evidence now. You mentioned the Council of Women World Leaders. We've looked at, we bring together minister, women ministers of health. And there is some evidence now that women ministers of health or education do perform better. They do try to reach the whole population. They, you know, there's beginning to be some um, ev evidence of that. Um, it's hard to speak about individual um, women leaders, but the Council of Women World Leaders um, was, was, is um, that group. And, and believe it or not, um, there are now 39 members who were de democratically elected, either currently are or were president or prime minister. That's the high-level council. Um, so we can't say that we're not there in a critical mass anymore. There, there are women leaders um, who, and there is more attention being paid. And first ladies, um, wives of African leaders are coming together and championing the issue of maternal mortality. For example, there'll be another of these, I can't remember if it's a lunch or a dinner, um, during the Clinton Global Initiative, which will have uh, women leaders coming to address maternal mortality. So there is a kind of leadership about it. It needs to be made more visible. It is, uh, the reason it's so unacceptable is, you know, I have to say it, Ray, um, if it was men who became pregnant, do you think we'd still have a situation where 500,000 men becoming pregnant died unnecessarily? I do not think so. I think it would have had more attention. Uh, you know, it's an awful thing to say. Well, especially it's because when the it's fixes women. are... Yeah simple and cheap yeah, and known. Exactly, you know, exactly. So. Deepak Chopra, um, let me get you into this conversation. Uh, we, you had some interesting things to say the other day when we spoke about um, how we neglect the feminine and neglect women when we talk generally about health and health maintenance. Yeah, first of all, <coughs> it's wonderful to be here. It's disappointing that 80% of the people in this audience are women. So that just shows you that even here we have a bias, <laughs> women's issues to women. Um, but um, uh, I think first of all, again, I also join uh, Ray in congratulating you as a, as a head of st former head of state who knows so much and is, has so much hands-on experience and is so practical about the issues, whether they're uh, maternal health or the health of uh, young women or adolescent women. I think if we really want to have a holistic approach to the issue of women's health, maybe we need to look a little bit historically as to why almost all societies in the world, it's not just developing countries, but Western cultures too, have historically been basically male-dominated, patriarchal societies. And I personally think that's, uh, you know, it's part of our revolution in a sense. You know, as hunter-gatherers, the male dominated the tribe and went out to get the hunt or bring the food. And the woman was at home, and uh, she was given the responsibility of rearing the children. It's not just 50% of the sky that was held up by the women. I would say it was 80% or more because in, a, in many ways the male was dispensable. And from an evolutionary point of view, I mean, this is part of our evolution, survival of the fittest, and has, in fact, ensured our survival. But it has also given women throughout the world a second-class position. There is from a point of view of social justice, it's completely um, unequal, the status of women in the world, whether it's in this country or any other country, having an occasional head of state doesn't mean anything because what's happening at the level of the village has to do with a context that's historical, that's cultural, that's economic, that's religious, uh, it's very complex. So a woman has no say in her sexual uh, choices, uh, not because of 
a simple reason. The reason is so, f so complex. It has to do with religious uh, fundamentalism. It has to do with extreme poverty. It has to do with lack of education. It has to do with cultural taboos. So how are we ever going to actually get a way where you have a holistic approach while at the same time you're tackling maternal health, mortality? You're tackling, you know, the problem of adolescent women getting pregnant and you have a, essentially a reductionist approach, you know, but where is the holistic solution to all this? From the little experience I've had, uh, uh, what we've found, and this is part of a foundation that I've worked with, a private foundation, is if you can find a way to help women in these, especially in the developing world, and in poor countries, if you can find a way of helping women to be economically empowered yeah. more than anything else, yeah. it makes a huge difference. Mm. So one of our earlier experiments, you know, from a foundation that's called the America India Foundation, which is uh, Indians in America help, trying to help the situation in India, was that we did a fundraiser for women in a village around Mumbai. And we sent out a questionnaire. The questionnaire was, if you were to get something worth $100, what would you choose? Can anyone guess what illiterate women in a village outside Mumbai would want for $100? It would be something to collect water. Anyone else? A <laughs> hundred dollars money alone. They wanted a computer. Okay, these are illiterate women in a village outside of Mumbai. And when they were asked why, and by the way, you can get a computer for a hundred bucks in India. Okay. When they were asked why, they said, they would be able to more easily uh, reach their retailers in Mumbai through email. They could figure out how to use an email. And when they went um, on, uh, you know, once a week or twice a month to B Mumbai to sell their woven baskets or shawls, they could actually reach a lot of people and double or triple or quadruple their income. So, of course, that's what we got them. But then as we looked around the country, we found that anywhere where there's a scheme to microfinance women, you know, in India, you can buy a cow for $4. Okay. You sell, you give $4, the equivalent of $4 to some rural woman. She buys a cow. She creates a milk business. In six months, she returns the loan at 25% interest, these boutique banks are doing better than any of your mm. banks of America or whatever. Mm. And she returns That's that. That's not saying much. Huh? That's not saying <laughs> That's much. Not saying much. <laughs> she returns the money, she buys another cow. Okay. In about a year, she has a milk business with a bunch of cows and she's now employing other women to help her. But what's the long-term consequence of this? The long-term consequences is AIDS is going down because now the woman feels empowered to make choices. She can say no. She's the one who's bringing the money in. You give the same money, by the way, in, into a village in India uh, to a man, and this is unfortunate, uh, he'll go and drink it. Okay, he'll buy a bottle of rum. Okay. But you give the same money to a woman, she'll create a business out of it. And this has bec actually become a huge business right now. Banks are making 20 to 30% return on their money by micro-lending to women who are creating a new economy in these villages. The children are going to school. AIDS comes down. The entire demographic of the village changes. And it has a direct impact on things like maternal mortality or pregnancy because now these women feel that their education, their empowerment is something that can change the demographic of society, the health of society. 
So I think any holistic approach that we have has to include empowerment of women. And the fastest way to empower women is economically. Money speaks everywhere, not only in this society, but all societies. So I feel that this is going to be a very long-term process. Improving the health of women is probably the most important thing one can do for society. The health of children depends on the health of women in society because children, their homeostatic mechanisms, their self-repair mechanisms, the, what we now know as the healing system, is based on an emotional bond that the children have usually to a mother figure, uh, even in Western societies, where children do not have the experience of bonding emotionally with a mother figure in the first two or three years of life, these children not only are unhealthy as they grow older physically, because your self-repair mechanism is a phenomenon scientifically understood as limbic resonance. So the emotional well-being of the mother figure, the physical well-being of the mother figure actually has a direct impact on not only the emotional development of a child, but the physical development of the child. And not only the physical development, but what happens as self-repair healing mechanisms, which we now know are very important because there's a factor called host susceptibility to disease. And, you know, you can have um, 10 people exposed to the same pathogen, but not everybody gets ill because some people are more resistant to it. We also now know that in societies where there is violence, which you mentioned, um, uh, violence against women, which ultimately also translates into violence against children, what you have is 20 years later, and there's a paper right now in psychosomatic medicine this year, uh, February 2nd, a huge correlation between autoimmune illnesses and hospitalization between autoimmune illnesses, not only in these developing countries, but in the United States. All kinds of diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, Sjogren's disease, it's a huge correlation between trauma or violence in children and in childhood uh, as a result of domestic violence, which is a huge problem, by the way, in not only poor countries, but right here in the United States. In the United States, these, these people, 20 to 30 years later, are developing uh, autoimmune illnesses. It's as if the immune system doesn't know who's a friend, who to trust, or who's an enemy, so it starts to attack its own body. It has no sense of self, uh, and has a huge sense of shame, and self-mutilation is a part of this process. So the health of women is actually probably the most important factor in the health of a society. These children are going to be either peacemakers or terrorists as they grow up. And if you see, you know, where these terrorists are groomed right now in the world, uh, you can go back to what's happening in their childhood, what's happening with women, what is the health of women, what is uh, how, how empowered these women are. So that's one whole aspect, I think, that needs to be focused on. Um, one of the things that I see very promising, but not too promising because, you know, unlike those women in, in Mumbai who asked for a computer, a lot of women in the world do not have access to the Internet. But our new technologies, you know, Twitter, Internet, email, are in a way bringing a lot of awareness to women in the Middle East. They're bringing a lot of awareness to women in Iran recently. And I think we need to take advantage of this kind of technology in in actually bringing awareness to these issues that Amnesty International has brought awareness to. So I'll stop here, um, but I have a whole other uh, point of view on how um, the sacred feminine in our society is so missing that uh, we have come to the culmination of the survival of the fittest. If we are to move to the next stage of our evolution, it has to be survival of the wisest. 
And for that, we need to actually pay very close attention to, you know, the archetypal woman in different societies. We have to pay attention to the role of mythology. You know, there's work that has been done through the United Nations where storytelling and empowering women through their mythical stories and their mythical needs makes a huge difference in how uh, society functions. So there's a lot more that can be done, but for the moment I'd stop here because I think uh, we need well, to have a further uh, we'll, discussion. We'll definitely uh, return to that. Are there certain baseline declarations we can make about what women should expect no matter where they are on the planet? I mean, it's so hard to talk about women, period, mm -hmm. when in some countries you're dying for lack of $3 worth of medicine, while in another country that, that mm -hmm. could never happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so what could you say about the women in these two different mm -hmm. uh, places? I'm wondering if, if context and wealth and, and uh, ri guaranteed rights mm -hmm. just change the conversation so much that it, it keeps the list pretty short of what you could say about women everywhere. Well, from a human rights perspective, I mean, we have um, an international human rights system and we have a convention for the elimination of discrimination against women, the CEDAW, which is extremely important now because it's bringing women's groups together and helping them to organize and to, um, to hold their governments accountable, including local authority, and to stop discrimination, stop inequality. But I very much agree with um, an early point that you, you made, Deep, about um, the uh, sort of uh, the ways in which women uh, still in so many countries see themselves and are seen as second-class citizens. And part of that undoubtedly is the way that religion has supported all too often that perspective and in some cases really reinforces it. And I mention this, Ray, because um, uh, relatively recently I've been officially designated an elder, so I've had to live with that. But, <laughs> but at the last uh, meeting of the elders, you know, the Mandela uh, group, um, we actually decided to tackle this. It's not going to be easy, but we have a statement on our website, and we are adamant that we have to confront the way in which religion is used to subjugate women. And, you know, I mean, it's not always the case, but it's still a big issue. And uh, we feel, you know, that this has to be addressed um, as, a, as, as, an, as, a, as an actual part of uh, the empowerment of women, the full empowerment. But how um, do you make that argument without it sounding like, oh, no, here come either A, Westerners, or Westernized elites from my own part of the world telling me I ought to be or I deserve to be like somebody somewhere else when that's irrelevant to the world that met me at my doorstep when I got up this morning. But that's precisely what you know, we've uh, sort of been charged um, by Mandela himself to do. It is to, to be in the places and to listen, not to come with our ideas from the outside but to actually know that people locally know more. I mean, I agree very much about the extraordinary um, organizing um, uh, phenomenon now of women in the informal sector. And one of the elders is Ila Bat, head of the Self-Employed Women's Association in, in, in India. Um, again, you, you talk about the internet. Um, there was a case in Colombia um, where waste pickers took on a waste um, uh, company, corporation, that was going to, uh, in fact, have a monopoly of the waste picking they'd be doing, the poorest women, and they tackled in court and won. And I saw the email traffic going around the world of tell us what you did, how, how did this happen? Such an empowering moment. And I forgot, I think when I was talking about what Amnesty is doing to say that they have focus, Amnesty is focusing on two of the areas you talked about, um, economic empowerment of women in slum areas in particular, and secondly, maternal mortality. So. You know, looking at those two areas, you know, looking at the rights of the poor and focusing on those two areas is, is, is very interesting. It's, it's kind of, uh, what should women expect? They should expect to have their rights um, uh, supported and protected, uh, progressively realized. Um, this means that all of the MDGs are very relevant to women, tackling poverty because of the feminization of poverty, the feminization of AIDS. AIDS in Africa has the face of a young girl. 
We have grandmothers who are looking after 19 grandchildren. I've met them, and I think you probably may have met them in, in Tanzania. It's, it's a, uh, there are so many issues that, that, are, that are interrelated in that way, but um, we do need more women in decision-making positions for that reason. That's why, if you like, things like the Council of Women World Leaders, um, the uh, way in which women are organizing um, in groups to tackle violence, the uh, uh, campaigning, in, particularly in the month of November, against um, both domestic violence and sexual violence worldwide. And most of all, and this is maybe to the point that you raised, um, it's empowering women locally um, and helping them to change their circumstances. And financial, economic empowerment, microcredit is absolutely vital to them. I very much Go agree. Ahead. Um, I think we cannot underestimate the damage that comes from organized religion everywhere in the world. It would be foolish not to look at this problem. I mean, we still have discrimination of women by organized religion in the United States. You know, you, women don't have the same rights as uh, deacons or priests uh, in Western cultures as well. But when you go to these cultures where there is so much violence, it's much worse. And unless this fact is dealt with head on, and unless women are made aware that this is a huge issue in their culture, and one of the ways to do this is actually to identify in every culture there are figures in history, in their culture of women leaders, whether they are religious leaders or they are cultural leaders or they are artistic leaders. You can find them in, in, in these, even in these very disenfranchised people. Of course, in India, there's a tradition of the, the goddess tradition, you know, so that there are places where women worship and men worship the feminine face of God. And if that kind of mythology is uh, re-energized through storytelling, through looking at history, then it makes a huge difference in that women come forward. You know, if you go to Saudi Arabia, for example, you know, women are very discriminated, but yet, you know, you'll see them um, as surgeons, as physicians, as in places of... Uh, in places of uh, great uh, power in the co corporate world, um, but they are still religiously subdued. You know, they're still religiously dominated. I think this is a conversation we need to have throughout the world, and that's where these internet technologies mm -hmm. start to creep in. You know, uh, do not underestimate the power of technology. Technology and its power at this moment is doubling every year, which means that in 10 years, the power of technology will be a million times what it was today, what it is today. We didn't have the internet in 1995. We now have the ability to change that conversation. But it has to be changed, not that, that the Westerners are coming and telling people to change the conversation, but you can actually recruit the resources of these women um, in these parts of the world who want to be empowered. Go to Afghanistan, talk to the women there, mm. and you learn so much about what they want. Well, whether it's the web and giving a woman a $100 computer or microfinancing or the rag pickers or um, cooperatives using solar panels to charge batteries and then selling charged batteries to all their neighbors. It sounds like government is just a pain in the neck and <laughs> it's a guy thing and a lot of this stuff just happens if women create structures that, that move parallel to government rather than wait for it to come help them. No, I think I would be... <laughs> you, you provoke me. <laughs> I On would, purpose, <laughs> Madam President. Uh, uh, I would be, you know, uh, very keen to see that uh, the institutions in a country are influenced by um, the participation of half the population, influenced um, that uh, the approach, the decision-making is different. Uh, it, it, it's very interesting uh, to see what's happened in Rwanda, uh, partly because of the terrible genocidal killing there, but it has the highest number of women in parliament in the world. And it, it, women are you know, really influencing 
the policy and decision making in a huge way in that country. But look at, at the all other, these positive examples yeah, that were cited. Yeah. They don't rely on government. They don't rely on government finally recognizing the needs that they have or understanding their problem and helping them fix it. These women are going out and doing well, other I, things. Yeah. I'm not saying government's yeah. irrelevant, but yeah. if you're s sitting there dying while you're waiting for them. Government uh, will <laughs> follow. Yeah. Uh, there's a woman in the United Nations by the name of Monica Sharma. I don't know if you, you're familiar with her, but she's done work in over 150 countries. And her work is uh, taking development to a new level, where develop mean, development means uh, training of leadership skills mm. for women. In, uh, in basically in small villages. Mm -hmm. And once these women are trained to be leaders, again, it changes the whole demographic of health. But also I mentioned, society. you know, yeah, but you know, in talking about maternal um, mortality, that has to be addressed by government yes. policies. Mm -hmm. And they have to penetrate. Similarly, if governments do have a commitment to the equality of women, then it has to permeate right through all of the um, policies of that government, including economic policies. And thankfully, we're getting more women ministers of finance now, instead of having this idea that there are so-called so women's issues. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's very important that we recognize uh, what's happening because so many people work in the informal sector, and they do work. They do several jobs, possibly, together, they, uh, and that they are becoming more organized, and they are using, as you said, uh, the information technologies. But there still are huge barriers um, to being able to address some of the underlying um, uh, policy issues. And, and, and I think um, uh, leadership itself uh, benefits from participation by both men and women. In Norway now, they have a requirement, even in the private sector, that boards of corporations have an equal number of men and women, because they have understood that this brings a value to the board decisions. Um, again, people have talked about if it had been Lehman Sisters, would it have happened? You know, but I mean, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, you know structures that bring about a balance. Um, uh, the quota system is transforming local elections, including in your country, in India, where thousands of women are now taking part as members of local councils. And th these are the structures that we must have as part of changing the profile um, and ultimately changing the context um, of what we're, what we're talking about, of, of, of policies in relation to women's health, prioritizing women's health more. We await your questions. There's a microphone in that aisle and a microphone on that aisle, and I'd love to hear what you've been thinking, what you want to follow up on while we've been talking. Please it's go ahead. It's hard to see you, isn't it? <laughs> and tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Dr. Laura Trice. Um, wow. <laughs> this is one of the most powerful talks I've heard since I've gotten here and just about in general. Um, I wanted to ask the panel, I mean, we are asking what women have the right for. I do a couple different things, but a story comes to mind of when I was um, working with a group of people in drug and alcohol rehab where um, a young girl was relating having been sexually assaulted. And when she was heading back to the guest house where it happened, her whole body told her that something was off. So women have this strong instinct, or a lot of times they do. And there's something that's happened where they don't always honor it or listen to it. And so I wanted to ask you how much of this starts in the home with a father treating his wife well, teaching his daughter to listen to her instincts, showing his son how to listen when a daughter or another woman says no to something. Um, Leonard Schlein did a book called Sex, Time, and Power, basically saying that we as a civilized society became civilized when women realized the connection between having intercourse, getting pregnant, and their death and they learned to say no so they could evaluate the character of the person they were going to be with. So I wanted to ask you, how much of what we look at in a world issue is really stuff that is, they say kids are better, what is it, imitators and listeners. How much of this really starts in the home with how we relate to each other and to children in demonstrating that? You know, when you're dealing with issues like this, you're dealing with uh, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, of conditioned behavior. And it's very difficult to change that kind of conditioning 
which has become part of the tribe, which has become part of the culture. Uh, we see it much more in tribal societies, but we see it here. Now, I think it's very important to recognize that even though we had the rise of feminism in the 70s with Gloria Steinem and others, it was a reactive feminism. It was a strident, angry feminism, which was basically a feminism that said women have equal rights and we want them. Okay. Now, it was a very necessary phase in the rise of feminism because had it not happened, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. And that's only, we're talking about 35 years ago, right? But I think we now are at a stage where we need to recognize the essential biological differences between men and women. There are biological differences. You know, there's one egg for 250 million sperm, and you have to wonder why. Okay, there are biological differences in that a woman has to nurture a fetus in a womb for nine months, you know, while the male is free to do what he wants. So one must recognize biological differences. One must recognize hormonal differences. One must recognize the fact that these have a very different impact on our psychophysiological makeup. The more we begin to understand what is called women's intelligence now, because nobody's paid attention to this all this while. It is becoming very clear that women are, and we should have known this intuitively after all, we've all had mothers, and if we were in a, if we were in a safe environment, then we recognize that you know, the mother was the safest haven for a child. But it's very well recognized now that women are likely to be less predatory Women are likely to be less um, uh, uh, less uh, violent. Women are likely to be more contextual in their thinking, more relational, more holistic, more nurturing, more tender, more affectionate. Look at all the problems in the world right now, whether it's war or terrorism or devastation of the environment or um, extinction of species, it's a dominantly male energy. Now, for evolutionary reasons, it may have been relevant in the past. But as Jonas Salk, one of the greatest thinkers of our time, he said, you know, that phase of evolution is over. The next phase of our evolution depends on survival of the wisest. And survival of the wisest means, in fact, bringing in this, harnessing the feminine archetypal energies that are present in women, of course, but we also have as men. But we've kind of shied away from them because it's embarrassing to be vulnerable. It's embarrassing to be emotional. It's embarrassing to be saying, I'm intuitive, I'm tender, I'm affectionate. But unless we bring back that into our culture, into our corporations, as, uh, as you were saying in Norway, they have the system where you have to have equal participation in the corporate culture, once you bring that, it is automatically going to change the environment. You know, it doesn't mean having a Golda Meir or a Indra Gandhi or a Margaret Thatcher or a Mary Robinson as the head of state. It has to seep down into the culture. I'd also like, because I think it's a very good question to uh, respond to the, uh, the importance of what happens in the home. And I'll just give a few examples that came to my mind when I, when I heard the question. First of all, my father was a doctor in the west of Ireland. My mother was also a doctor. But my father used to come back in frustration sometimes from having attended at the birth because in that stage, Ireland was, and especially the west of Ireland, was quite poor. And a lot of the uh, deliveries were at home with a midwife. And he would come as the doctor just to make sure that everything was all right. And when the baby was delivered, the mother would ask him, tell me, doctor, is it a boy or a child? Is it a boy or a child? You know, so just that sort of sense. And I often feel that we underestimate the extent to which women, mothers, are role models for their sons. How do mothers treat their sons? Um, I sometimes explain when I'm asked, you know, when did, where did you get your interest in human rights? And I say it's because I was wedged between four brothers. And how could I not be interested in human rights and equality <laughs> and all that? But actually, when I think back, 
the extraordinary thing. My parents uh, did have a sort of environment in our home of a genuine equality, which means that my brothers did at least as much housework as I did. You know, in other words, they had to do the chores. There wasn't a kind of, and I think that's extraordinarily important, and we will not have equality in the marriage and in the partnership uh, relationships unless there is more sharing of child rearing and home duties, and that is happening. I mean, I'm you know, very pleased that there's a different generation in many contexts. But another memory that came to my mind, which I found very striking at the time, um, last January, uh, I was with some of my colleagues in Realizing Rights, supporting um, some African groups, um, notably Fam Africa Solidarity, um, on um, a forum for women from throughout Sudan, focusing on Darfur. We would have liked to have had it in Darfur, and we're now planning another one in Darfur in October, I hope, but we weren't allowed, it wasn't safe, um, especially with the pending ICC, the International Criminal Court um, uh, indictment. So in fact, we had it in um, uh, Addis Ababa. And on the first evening, I was invited to come along and meet the steering committee of this forum, women from Khartoum, from Juba in the south, and from the three regions of uh, Darfur, and one representing the, the diaspora of women from Sudan concerned about Darfur. So there were six women. And I had an extraordinarily good friend with me at the time, uh, and a, another colleague, she's from um, Zimbabwe, in fact, and she heads the um, Young Women's Association Worldwide, YWCA. And she did a very clever thing. She said, look, before we start talking about the forum, let's just tell each other a little about ourselves, to your point. And the women started to tell about themselves. And in every case, in every single case, one of the most important things was, and my father believed in me. My father encouraged me. My father, and I was very struck by that. I was, I was extremely struck by um, the fact that these were now the leadership and their father believed in them. So, uh, you know, everything starts. The prejudices start, but also the encouragement starts. And the mothers are role models for their sons as well as their daughters in that sense, you know. And I think we, we really have to encourage much more thinking about this. You were talking, Deepak, about thousands of generations of... Uh social evolution, but I'm wondering how much of that is conditioned really by near-in factors. Not thousands of generations, but where you live and how you live today. Right now, if you go to um, counties across America and talk to law enforcement, they'll tell you that they're arresting more women for committing mm -hmm. violent crimes than ever before, and that the level of violence of their crimes is something that they've never seen before. Uh, this would seem to be pushing back against uh, what you were just saying about um, this being basically male energy. Uh, there are law enforcement people testifying in hearings and such that given the right circumstances, given the context, women can be as ferocious and bestial as any man. I don't think that's biologically true, but that, that may also be a conditioned response to the kind of societies that we've created. Um, uh, there's a lot of literature now on emotional intelligence and how emotional intelligence, once it's harnessed by men or women, actually leads to uh, a much better outcome in, uh, in situations of conflict for conflict resolution. It hasn't yet, I don't think, been tried in politics, I'm unaware of, but I have worked in uh, uh, situations where there are you know, conflicts, even in, say, Israel and Palestine, between young adolescents going to the same school because of their differences. You know, I'm Jewish and you're Arab. And when you bring in techniques of uh, emotional intelligence, um, suddenly you start to see that these children relate to each other. So it's very difficult to work with adults who've been conditioned. But when you start to talk to adolescents and uh, younger, younger people uh, who are more open to the new understanding of emotional intelligence and ultimately even what is being called spiritual intelligence, we'll see in the future that we have access to technologies that we haven't had before but in order to do that, we have to have a f better understanding of what intelligence is. See, again, we've kind of, uh, when we talk about intelligence, 
we mainly talk about rational intelligence, linear intelligence. But there's a lot of work now on, on multiple intelligences. So there's music intelligence, athletic intelligence, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, body intelligence, intuitive intelligence, creative intelligence. As we move forward in our understanding, we'll have to recognize some of these biological differences and see how we can actually not only strengthen what's already there, but men will have to learn some of these skills as well. And uh, um, are there any other I just questions? Had a follow up on that. Sure. I'm, I wanted to say I th what your question is about the women, the violent crimes. My sense is that in the feminist movement, they got in touch with their yang or masculine side, and they're out of balance right now. A lot of women forgot the sacred feminine, and the men are in their yang trying to get in touch with the sacred feminine. So I think I feel like everybody has both. What I wanted to put out there was what we call patriarchy. I read this book called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And those are traditional male archetypes, with the king being generous and this and that. But he calls patriarchy boy psychology because it's more Lord of the Flies. Any culture that is oppressing or diminishing women isn't really of the healthy masculine archetypes. And so my question to the panel is, what are your thoughts? It's almost like as a civilization, we're in our adolescence, and the next step is really to step into adulthood of generosity, of gentleness, of all the things of balance. And I was wondering how you think that's going to happen. I think there's only one solution, and that is to increase awareness, whether it's through information technologies or through media or through education or through entertainment even. The more we talk about it, the more the collective conversation changes, the more likely is uh, what's happening out there uh, to change because the world is a reflection of our conversation. Mm. And I think having women... Uh, play much wider roles in society and have empowerment at every level um, uh, changes attitudes as well. I mean, uh, um, uh, I think it's um, uh, interesting to uh, reflect on your question about the female aggression, the young female. A lot of that is, I think, societal factors. Drink, uh, women are, are even using drugs as well, um, young women. Um, but um, I, I think there's a there's a sort of commodification and, and consumerism that, and even some um, uh, you know uh, girl bands etc. that are pushing this sort of because it seems to be a kind of popular way. It's reactive. Of, yeah, it's it? reactive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, uh, I think where we will see institutionalized change, and I do think that's important. I think it's very important what can be done by civil society and women's groups, but we need to change the structures of society because the barriers are still there. The lack of land rights and inheritance rights, the lack of access to capital or credit of any kind, the lack of um, sometimes permission to leave the home, you know, be able to go to the hospital and, and get the treatment, the, having no money to do that, um, not being allowed as a woman to be out on your own and so on, and, the, and then the, 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 the violence, um, all of that needs um, a kind of institutional change and I personally believe that one way of doing this is to have uh, much more uh, balance um, in every structure of society, um, in government at every level and in um, trade unions, in the private sector and um, right across the board. Uh, many countries are now doing this by a quota system and I think quotas can be very important. Um, at a certain stage it's better if you don't need quotas anymore. If, there, you know, if you've got that critical mass. I certainly do believe that the comment was made about, it, it doesn't matter, you know, um, I happen to be a woman who was first in a number of ways, first woman president, etc. But I always felt when I was in the Irish Senate, for example, it was when there was a critical mass of women that we began to be able to address the priorities, reform the rape law, address you know, discrimination against children outside marriage, a whole lot of issues that... Um, were priorities for us, but wouldn't have been priorities for the Parliament before that, because there weren't that critical number of women involved. And I think that's true in government as well. That if you have, it's true in the judiciary. Um, once you have women um, in the senior positions as judges, that's why um, I think it's very welcome that there's going to be a second woman on the Supreme Court in this country. It's extremely important. We have time for one more question. I have a question about institutional um, frameworks, too, Mary. One being the church, and another being education for women, mm -hmm. and, and where you would prioritize. You spoke about ministries of health and 
raising that up in the profile, but on the ground, the church and education seem, would seem to be great ways to, to address issues of women's health. Well, I agree very much um, with that, and in fact, it comes back to the second um, issue that I raised um, in our first um, uh, discussion th this afternoon, um, the adolescent girl. Uh, you know, there is now, I'm very glad to say, a kind of movement around the adolescent girl. It involves a number of foundations, the UN Foundation, the Nike Foundation, a lot of women's organizations, etc. And it is so important uh, because the, the adolescent girl has so many barriers in so many contexts and cultures. And um, uh, she's going to be the young woman, she's going to be the mother, she's going to be the grandmother, etc. And so uh, her access to education is extraordinarily important. I think I've seen that if a, if, a, if a girl has access to seven years of education, um, she will um, space her children, fewer of them will die. I mean, there are all the health implications of just that access to education. And um, coming back to the church, uh, it, it reminds me of um, when, when we were discussing as elders the fact that we really needed to take this on. And um, Jimmy Carter, who is one of the elders, spoke eloquently, President Carter spoke eloquently about um, the way in which he had addressed the situation in his Baptist church in Atlanta. And eventually, he and his wife left the church because there was not the achievement of um, equality of women. And I kind of looked at him and said, well, you know, are you expecting me to take on the Pope? You know, we laughed. <laughs> and was, it's all very well, but um, that's a slightly bigger challenge. I think but the nuns are taking on the Pope. <laughs> exactly, yes. But I mean, but in fact, a lot of things need to be taken on, and you know, I, I cut my political teeth introducing family planning legislation in Ireland, and I got denounced by bishops, and I got, you know, it was a very difficult time. But um, we have to address um, these issues in, in every society, and um, it's um, real social change takes place from within societies, not from people from the outside. But it can be enormously important to give the encouragement to. Um, you know, uh, to have um, possibilities, um, like with that group of women um, who told their stories about how important their father was. Um, there was something very empowering about that conversation. And I think we all went away strengthened by this exchange about, you know, what had been the influence that had, because these women were, were, were they were the leaders um, in that context of that forum and will be as the forum uh, continues. Men haven't been able to come together in Darfur it's women who have come together across Sudan for Darfur. And I think we need to see more of that kind of leadership, really from the bottom up and, um, and, and encourage. But we've known there's a slingshot effect for dollars spent on women's education mm -hmm. for decades. Yeah. That you get a bigger return on investment mm -hmm. from adding a year yeah. to a woman's accumulated years in school than you get for spending that same mm -hmm. dollar on giving a young fella another mm. year mm. in school. And the health implications, their earning potential, their effectiveness as farmers increases. Mm. Uh, yet, in 2009, we still have to urge people to do it. Like, mm. we have to get over this hump and convince them it's a good idea. Why? Well, it was interesting, you know, maybe it's not a very good illustration, but it is, I think, about power. Um, when this movement about the adolescent girl started, a number of us who supported it go to Davos, which is a big, mainly male, um, World Economic Forum. And we tried for years to get one plenary session of Davos on the adolescent girl. And until last year, it just was not possible. It wasn't important enough. And that's the real key. It's all about power and who's exercising that power. And unfortunately, um, all too often, it's... Um, power being exercised in a way that doesn't reflect these priorities. Across uh, all sectors, mm, yeah. the Catholic Church or mm. other religious mm. organizations. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever, but it is about the power, mm. as she says. Mm. Well, I think over the last yeah, hour, I'm you've gotten an idea of both how complicated and how necessary uh, talking these issues out is, and uh, how much there is yet to be achieved. Please thank Mary Robinson and Deepak Chopra.